Years ago, at Moody Bible Institute, I had a student in class by the name of Manuel Zawarty. And uh, when I knew him, <clears throat> he was just full of passion and zeal for Jesus Christ. Before that, he was anything but. He was an evil person. He comes from Colombia in South America where he was in the drug cartel. And I'm going to let Manuel speak a bit for himself. I'm going to read you just a bit of what he wrote in an article that was published in a Christian magazine. My friends did not know that night after night I lay in bed crying desperately trying to escape the memories of homosexual abuse that plagued me. The abuse I received as a child had led me into a life of drugs, drinking, and immorality, all efforts to prove that I was a man. By high school, I was selling drugs. When I graduated at 16, I was already had the reputation as a, as a dealer. The mafia gave me a woman, a car, prestige, adventure. I thought I had everything. I had proved to the world that I was a man. But inside, I was still an abused eight-year-old trying to get rid of shame and guilt. Before long, my life was in jeopardy. I was driving home a friend who had just killed a man when two police cars began chasing us. They ran us off the road and in seconds had machine guns pointed at our faces. Another time, we were surrounded by a rival mafia family. And I thought I would have to shoot a man just before I pulled the trigger, though a police car drove by and everyone scattered. I was thankful because although I looked tough, I was scared beyond reasons. When missionaries moved to our area, I hated them instantly. They were religious, and worse, they were Americans. One day, one of the missionary kids, Mike Burnham, came up to my group as we, as we played ball. He said to me, I felt like I should come over and talk to you. He proceeded to tell me about God <clears throat> and invited me to a Christian camp. I found myself agreeing to go. I could see that Mike was different. He seemed happy and had a lot of courage to come over and talk to us. At camp soon, I had gone three days without drinking or doing drugs, and I really liked it. For the first time in my life, I began to believe that God might love me. One Bible passage made the greatest impact. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers will be able to keep Christ from loving me. Somehow I knew that even sexual abuse and a seemingly ruined life could not stop God from loving me. The night before camp was over, I told God, my life has been all messed up. If you are really alive and can live in somebody like me, then come into my life and change it. God, I need you. So he became a zealous Christian. God led him to Moody. He graduated. Now he's back in Columbia working as a youth pastor, and he has sent some of his young people from his youth group to Moody Bible Institute to study. Now, the story of <clears throat> Manuel is that of a man rebelling against God <clears throat> and being miserable in doing so. But he eventually heard the truth. In accepting it, he turned from a sinful, unhappy life to a new and joyful one. Was Manuel's rebellion unusual? After all, we expect that kind of a lifestyle from drug dealers, from people in the mafia, are they, only, are they the only rebellious people? No, Psalm 2 speaks of all people's hostility toward God. Everybody rebels against God by refusing to obey His revealed will. And Psalm 2 warns that our rebellion is doomed to failure. It leads to unhappiness, and God one day will end our rebellion with appropriate punishment. So this text, Psalm 2, urges us to prudently submit to God, to avoid unhappiness and divine punishment, and to reap the joys and blessings bestowed upon the obedient. Psalm 2 is a, an indirect messianic psalm. Historically, it referred to Israel's king. Now, scholars tell us, as the oath of office is read to the uh, newly elected president of the United States, Scholars tell us that Psalm 2 was read each time a new king was put on the throne in Israel. So for historically, it referred, to Israel's, it referred to Israel's kings, but prophetically, it refers to King Jesus. The Old Testament predicted that one day heaven would send a king to rule earth. On the first, Psalm, on the first Palm Sunday, thank you so much, Jesus rode into Jerusalem amid 
this cry, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And a few days later, Judas went to Jesus saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. The kiss was a sign of devotion, but Judas didn't mean that. He had no devotion in his heart to the Lord. And then the next day, most who had hailed him with Hosanna shouted out, crucify him. Now, our passage, uh, and crucify him, expresses how many people feel about Jesus Christ. Now, I want to sum up our psalm of 12 verses in one sentence. Here is the essence of it. The Lord's anointed ruler must be served. Why? In order to avoid divine wrath and secure divine blessings. In our paragraph, our passage is going to break down in these four paragraphs. In the first three verses, the rebels speak. In verses 4 through 6, God himself speaks. Then in verses 7 through 9, the anointed ruler, the Son of God, the Messiah speaks. And then in the last paragraph, 10 through 12, the Holy Spirit speaks. So let's take this handout that you've been given. This is my translation from the Hebrew text. And let's work our way quickly through this special passage. Now verse 1 opens with a rhetorical question. Why are the Gentile nations, notice the word Gentiles, not Hebrews, not Jews, why are the Gentile nations in violent rebellion? And why do the pagans, not Jews, not Hebrews, Gentiles, and why do the pagans devise a feudal revolt? Now, that's a, that's, those are two questions. They're not real questions. This is a figure of speech called eroticism, a rhetorical question used to express absurdity and indignation. So I want to know, this week, if you rebel against the United States government, can you overthrow it and assume the rule control in Washington, D.C.? You wouldn't have a chance to overthrow the United States government. And would you attract any attention in trying to do so? Oh, yeah. You would attract the attention of the authorities, and they would come after you. And they would punish you and probably put you in prison and throw the key away. It would be futile to try to topple the government of the United States. You're more likely to do that than to rebel against God and throw his authority off of you so that you can live the way you want to the rest of your life without any detriment or punishment. Now verse 2 defines this revolt more precisely by identifying those who lead it and those against whom the revolt is directed. I'm in verse 2. The kings of the earth make their defiant stand, and the rulers take counsel of war together against the Lord and against His anointed one. His anointed one is His Son, the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Acts 4 quotes this passage. God, by the Holy Spirit, through David's mouth, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings took their stand against the Lord, against His Christ. Truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Now notice uh, this passage is going to identify some who rebelled against God by re rebelling against the Son of God. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, Herod the king, Pontius Pilate, a, gover a, a Roman governor, along with the Gentiles, and look who else is rebelling against him. The people of Israel. In fact, they asked the Roman government to crucify their Messiah. Now verse 3 reveals the decision reached in the council of war. Now he's quoting the Gentiles who are rebelling against God. Let us smash their bonds of authority. Let us throw off their cords, that is, the obligations that they impose. The human being doesn't like God's obliga obliga uh, obligations, His requirements. And that's why Scripture says, We, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way, and there are no exceptions among us. I remember talking to a middle-aged woman, and she said to me, I'm very interested in Christianity, but I'm not convinced 
there's enough evidence to prove that Christianity is true. And I ask her, if God were to convince you that Christianity is true, would you become a Christian? And she said, I would not. Why not, I asked. Because I want to live life the way I want to live, not the way God, not the way the Bible tells me to live. She basically speaks for all of us. We want what we want, not what God wants. And so today, uh, the Bible is quite clear that a husband, a man, and woman are to marry and live in marriage. But there are plenty of people today who say, we don't need a marriage certificate to prove that we love each other. We'll just move in and start cohabitating, living together. There are people who don't like capital punishment. Uh, that seems, uh, even though the Bible is quite clear on that, that there are some crimes that should be punished by capital punishment, there are not a few people who dislike that. Oh, no. Take the worst lawbreaker, the person who murders other people, and don't put him to death, just put him in prison, and now we'll have the taxpayers support him, pay for him for the rest of his life until he dies. Uh, never mind sexual purity. No. Uh, if we want to indulge in immorality, uh, we're okay with that, too. So what is now the bottom line of this first paragraph? The human being dislikes obligations divinely prescribed, and so what do we do? We violate them. We disobey them. Is there one person here this morning who has never disobeyed God? Not one of us. Now verse 4 discloses God's response to man's rebellion. Verse 4. He who sits enthroned in heaven, enthroned, what does that mean? He is in complete control of the universe. He rules the earth, not me, not you, not the American government. He who sits enthroned in heaven laughs at man's rebellion. That doesn't mean he's unconcerned. It means he doesn't worry about man's rebellion. Now, some years ago, there was an old man walking down one of the streets, uh, sidewalks in Chicago, and a young thug walked up to him and put a pistol in his face and said, give me your money. And the old man laughed in the face of the thug. And the thug pulled the trigger, shot him between the eyes, and killed him. That old man laughed, and he didn't get away with it. God is laughing today at man's rebellion, and he gets completely away with it. Verse 4 ends by saying, the Lord, that, and the Hebrew word here means the sovereign, the one who is in total control of everything. The Lord sneers at them in contempt. Now verse 5 shows God's patience has a limit. He won't always laugh at man's rebellion. Then he will speak to them in his wrath, and he will terrify them in his fury. When he quits laughing, D-U-C-K, duck, because now his wrath is coming at you. And verse 6 tells us what God will say. You rebel, but I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. That is, God is going to seat Jesus when he comes back to, to earth in Jerusalem to rule the earth. You, re, you rebel, but I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. So what? Well, God seating his king there spells their doom. So what's the bottom line of paragraph 2? For, for now, God patiently observes. He laughs. Mankind's rebellion against heaven. But there is a limit to his patience. What happens today? If you try and overthrow the United States government, you attract their attention and they're coming after you. They will not remain passive and they will deal with. They will punish you and me if we attempt that. Now verse 7 introduces the Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lord's anointed ruler. And this will show that God's anointed means disaster to rebels. Verse 7, now the, the, the anointed ruler, Jesus, is speaking. I will reveal the Lord's decree. Now what is a decree? It is an unchangeable, irreversible, divine decision that shall be implemented. 
God has made a decision. He has put it in dried concrete. He will never go back on it. It will never be changed. He is planning to do it, and he will accomplish it. I will reveal the Lord's decree. He said to me, now, from the third line of verse 7, all the way through verse 9, the Son of God is going to be informing us what God said to him. He, God, said to me, you are my son. So they have a close father-son relationship. Today, I install you on the throne. Now, verse 8 continues the divine decree. Ask me, and I will give the Gentile nations as your inheritance, and the ends of the earth as your possession. Now, what does that mean? Christ will rule over everything and everybody. To date, no human king has ever ruled the entire earth. There have been not a few kings, presidents, generals who've tried to do that. They've all failed. But someday, a ruler is going to be in control of the entire earth, and that is the Son of God who came to earth and was willingly crucified for your sins and mine. Verse 9 finishes citing God's decree. You will break them. Who's the them? The rebels who don't like to submit to God. You will break them with an iron scepter. What does that refer to? Irresistible divine power. You will break them with an, with an iron scepter. You will smash them to pieces like pottery. Now, there will only be one ruler of the earth. There will only be one ruler of the universe, the earth, one ruler of our nation, one ruler of the church, one ruler of a family, one ruler of an individual. God has appointed but one person to rule everything and everybody. Fortunately, he is full, not only of authority and power, he is full full of compassion and love for you and me. How would you like to be under Vladimir Putin today? Or how about um, Xi in China? Or that little tubby dictator in North Korea? Or how about some of the, uh, the angry uh, rulers in Iran? How about under Adolf Hitler? There have been plenty of rulers who had enormous power and they didn't care for people. In fact, they murdered them. But the ruler of the universe is one who came down here for you and me and laid down his life to wash away our sins and bring us into a proper relationship with God. Now, verse 10, the Holy Spirit addresses those who are revolting against God. Therefore, now I want you to look at that word, therefore. It's looking back to the last line in verse 9. The Messiah will smash rebels to pieces like pottery. Why is he going to do that? There will be people who refuse to bend the knee and submit to him. Therefore, O kings, act wisely. Heed the warning, O judges of the earth. Well, now why is the Lord addressing the rulers and judges and kings? Because they lead people. They have an enormous influence on people. Verse 11 through 12 gives the warning proper in three commands. I mean, verse 11, serve the Lord with fear. Otherwise, judgment is coming. There is a price to pay for rebelling against God. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Why the trembling? Realize that by the skin of your teeth, you are missing the wrath of God. Now, uh, Maureen tells me that this week, her daughter uh, in New York, I think, was broadsided uh, by another car, smashed her car. And she's fortunate that she wasn't hurt worse than she was. Uh, some time ago, I had a student who, uh, like Maureen's daughter, was in a terrible accident and he said, I got up out of my smashed car and, and walked away and called the state police and just standing on the side of the highway, just real calm, looking at my damaged car. 
I wasn't upset at all until the state patrolman came out and looked at it and said, you should have been crushed to death in that crushed car. And my student said, realizing how close I came to destruction, I began trembling uncontrollably. I could not stop trembling when I realized how close I had come to death or serious injury. Rejoice with trembling, while the trembling, you have come in your sins and rebellion very close to being on the receiving end of the wrath, the judgment, the punishment of God. Verse 12, pay homage to the Son. The Hebrew says literally, kiss the Son. Kiss would denote a sign of devotion to Him and not rebelling against Him. But remember, Iscariot kissed the Son in rebellion against Him. So pay homage to the Son lest he becomes angry and you perish because of your insubordination. For his wrath will flare up. How blessed and happy are all who seek refuge in him. Now, in the, as the New Testament closes, the Apostle John got a glimpse of the glorified Christ, and here's what he wrote. Christ's head and hair were like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet like, br like burnished bronze, glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of many waters, powerful. It, from his mouth came a two-edged sword. What's that for? His enemies, those who rebel. And his face was shining like the sun in its strength. That is the Son of God. Not as he was on the earth. He appeared in earth on the earth as a weak human being who allowed himself to be strung up on the cross and let your sins and mine be uh, pinned on him. God's wrath fell on Jesus, so it need not fall on you and me. And we need to remember that Jesus told his disciples when they tried to save him from being arrested by the Romans, don't you guys realize? I could call 12 legions of angels who would come and rescue me, but he didn't. So, Christ is divinely appointed to receive your submission, my submission. God commands you and me to live the way the Son of God tells us to live. Did you create yourself in the womb? You did not. He did. Therefore, we are not free to live any way we want. We are obligated, required, to be submissive to God and live the way He instructs us to. Psalm 2 and verse 8, Ask me, the Son said to the Father, no, the Father said to the Son, and I will give the Gentile nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. How does Jesus feel about that? What? Well, he right now is up in heaven sitting at the Father's right hand, eager to come back down here and suppress the rebellion against him and take vengeance on his adversaries who strung him up on the cross. Jesus is waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. That's a very weak translation here. The Greek word is very strong. He's chomping at the bit. He's eager as a beaver to come back down here and suppress mankind's rebellion against heaven. Am I rebelling against Christ now? Declining his salvation? Disobeying his word? Oh, what are we doing there? If that's you, you are waving a red flag at a strong, powerful, angry bull and... You have his attention. And that angry bull is coming right at you. The Son of God is very aware of either our rebellion against him or our submission to it. What he requires of us is both reasonable and doable. He doesn't raise the standards so high. None of us can measure up to it. My yoke, that means the requirements I put on you. The, the commands I give you. My yoke is easy. And my load is doable. We were created to be in a loving, submissive relationship with Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.18, all things have been created by Christ. And look at that word, F-O-R, 
for him. You and I have been made for the Son of God. So when you walk out of church and get in your car and you realize that you're almost out of gas, you'll go to a service station and you're going to fill up. But gas is so expensive today. I have a suggestion. Instead of putting gasoline in your gas tank, fill it with Kool-Aid. If that won't work, how about hairspray? Or maybe try house paint. None of that's going to work. Why? Your car's engine has been made to run smoothly, properly on gasoline. Our heart, our soul has been made for the Son of God. But fill our soul with sin, vice, worldliness, sinful pleasures. We don't run happily, joyfully, nor peacefully. And why would that be? You and I have been made for a submissive, loving, healthy relationship with the Son of God. So, Lord, thank you so much for creating us and instructing us on how we should not and how we should live. We thank you for your Son that came down here. It's amazing. The one who is almighty and going to rule the universe willingly went to the cross and paid for our sins. Now, may we be prudent and act wisely and bend the knee and submit to him. We ask for your help in this. In Jesus' name, amen.